Ladies, welcome and Merry Christmas. I hope you have on that ugly Christmas sweater or maybe your Christmas PJs today. Now, obviously, our women's Christmas event looks very different this year. Shocker, I know. But I just want to say thanks for rolling with it anyway. There's a lot that we can't do right now, but there's a lot that we can do. And what we still can do is worth doing, and it's good. So I'm so glad you're here with us today. I hope you all got that email already that explained the game plan, right? So you're all set to meet up with someone right after this talk. Now, just in a minute, you're gonna get to hear from our dear friend, Nita Kalisa. I am so thankful for her message. And I just have to take a moment and applaud her courage here. You know, when we face a valley in life, some think it's best to just keep it to ourselves and definitely not to broadcast our struggles and heaven forbid, share our fears with anyone. But she is choosing to let us in even when she didn't have to. So between you and me, she was a bit concerned that maybe this talk would be a bit of a downer. As we talked through it, I thought, no, Nita, this is just what we need to hear. So many of us are walking through our own valley right now, and we need to hear from yours. We need to learn from your wisdom and be encouraged from your journey, even if you're currently in the valley. And she went for it. So way to go, Nita. We appreciate you and we love you. Just one last instruction before we get to Nita's talk. After you watch this, like we talked about in the email and in the beginning, we have a game plan that you're gonna connect with someone else right after this. Even if it's just one person over the phone or if you have a Zoom meeting set up or maybe you're gathered with your discipleship group or your small group now in a living room or maybe you're on a Zoom screen together. Either way, let's be in this together. So we don't just wanna sit here and passively consume this important message all by ourselves in front of a computer screen. We wanna be women that are growing. So let's take this step to become more like Jesus and to connect with others right after this. You're gonna see some discussion questions that pop up on your screen directly following her talk. And I really, really wanna encourage you to take this opportunity, even if you have to take the initiative to pick up the phone and call someone and to process these together after. So without further delay, let's welcome my dear friend, Nita. Hello, Bridge at Bear Creek Ladies. Fasten your seat belts. I'm about ready to take you on a 56 and a half year road trip. Pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you. As a 17 year old high school graduate, my mom wisely suggested that I take a gap year and so I worked as a secretary. I was excited then the following year to enroll at Eastern Montana College in elementary education because in 1960, the options for young women were teacher, secretary, nurse, or you could marry the guy up the creek and be a rancher's wife. That was it. One day in the fall of my sophomore year, I saw this gangly guy headed across campus and I learned he was from my roommate's hometown of Mile City and I told her I wanted to meet him. My roommate said, Doug, Doug Kalisa, you want to meet Doug? So we began with Coke dates and from then on we were dating exclusively for the next couple of years. And then off Doug went to Denver University to obtain his accounting and economics degree from a more prestigious university. Well, we traveled back and forth as often as we could and uh, became engaged in March of 1964. Now, this is a photo of the way Doug proposed to me. It was a note hanging from the, the pull chain on the light in the bedroom. And the reason it says, will you marry me, us, Doug and Jean, Jean was Doug's mom, and she pretty much raised Doug on her own because dad worked for the railroad and was off traveling for months at a time. So Doug and his mom were very close. So that note is an indication of the re wonderful relationship I had with a fabulous mother-in-law for the next mm, 40 years or so. Well, as we looked at the summer, there was only one day that we could get married in the whole summer, and that was August 16th. Well, that meant Doug graduated from DU on August 14th, then uh, drove 550 miles to Mile City, 
and then to the rehearsal, and he was late for the rehearsal, by the way, and I'm still holding on to that. And we hadn't seen each other for three months. So here we are, and then it was on to Denver to begin our married life together. Fast forward, I had a great job and taught third grade for five years um, in Arvada. And then, as we were expecting our first child, we purchased the house that we still live in today. Kirsta Jean arrived in 1969, Kent in 1972, and Kai in 1974. Thanks be to God, they are all believers, productive citizens, pay taxes as far as I know, are happily married and have given us eight grandchildren and one great granddaughter. Well, we enjoyed travel prior to COVID, reading, playing golf, sitting on the patio by the fire pit with a glass of wine. Um, gardening and talking. We talk a lot. About two years ago, I began to notice changes in Doug. He's never been good at remembering names, but it seems like he was beginning to have more difficulty than before. I heard him use more and more cliches in conversations, things like, what's up in your life? Or if he heard some negative news, he might say, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Or he could say, can't blame a guy for trying, who to thunk it? Or, are you qualified for that job? And then, over the years, Doug has misplaced a million or more things. We used to joke that it was a good thing his fanny was attached, or he would misplace that too. Lost items became even more common. His phone, his keys, his coffee cup, tools, you name it. Prior to his next physical with, primary, with his primary care doc, um, I called and requested a cognitive assessment as part of his appointment. He scored a bit low, but um, not significantly. The following year, he actually scored a little bit better, but the doctor did refer us to a neurologist. In May of 2020, we met with the neurologist who did extensive testing and put a name to what I was seeing, mild Alzheimer's disease. The diagnosis left me feeling wounded and aching and scared. And from our experience with Doug's mom, we already knew that number one, the disease has no cure. Number two, it is progressive. And number three, it will change our lives, our relationship, our roles, and our choices. Some of the recommendations included adding more exercise, puzzles, and singing to Doug's routine. We left the neurologist with a prescription for a generic Aricept, which delays the progress but has no curative powers whatsoever. As the reality set in, so did the what ifs. What if he can't take care of the yard? What if he forgets how to read? What if he forgets how to sign his name? What if he becomes agitated and violent? What if he begins to wander? What if he gets lost? What if he forgets the kids or grandkids? What if he needs more care than I can give him? What if he has to go to a memory care unit? What if he forgets me? The first scripture I thought of for comfort was Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I came to realize that there is not a suggestion here. This is a command. Do not be anxious. Anxiety or worry can paralyze us into a near catatonic state, incapable of decision-making, accomplishing tasks, or even logical thinking. And it says, do not be anxious about anything. Anything included every one of my what ifs. Instead, I was to praise. Supplication means to make a humble and sincere appeal to somebody in authority who can grant, who has the power to grant a request. That would be God. My prayer goes something like this. Lord, you know how scared and worried I am. I'm turning that worry over to you because you are my loving Father and I praise you for who you are. I'm so thankful that I can trust you to meet all of Doug's and my needs. 
Thank you, Lord, for the peace that you shower on me that I can't even begin to understand. But I know it guards my heart and mind, keeping me close to Jesus. Amen. I noticed some deterioration in Doug's previous mathematical acuity. His name recall continued to decline. Sometimes he had difficulty coming up with a word for common objects, the pruners, a broom, etc. Occasionally his frustration lapsed into an outburst of anger, slamming things, kicking an offending object, but it was never towards me. Frustration continues to boil over occasionally. Well, a follow-up in recently in August provided no new information, but Doug was given a prescription for generic Numenda, another medication to help slow the onset. She also recommended learning something new, a new language, dance lessons, singing, reacquainting himself with his guitar. Ah, yes, and then we have COVID. A new language? Well, really? Doug's ear for languages is pretty much deaf, other than English. Dance lessons? Probably not, since all dance studios are closed. And he has enjoyed singing with a barbership chorus for years, and with, also with a quartet. They have somewhat successfully attempted to sing while socially distancing, but now that the weather has eliminated singing in a park shelter, he's stuck with Zoom, which is less than satisfying. Knowing the value of music for Alzheimer's disease, it grieves me to see this important element of his life reduced to sitting in front of a computer once a week. Um, his guitar, still sits partially restrung in the basement. I'm not sure he knows how to finish that task. The new med seems to have reduced his anger outbursts, and when I commented on it, he's, he said, well, you also have to give me credit for self-control. Doug's ability to see cause and effect has somewhat diminished as well. He gets annoyed if I criticize his driving. He forgets that he has 79-year-old reflexes and the numerous decisions required by driving demand focusing on many elements at the same time. So I have begun to do most of the driving. It reduces the anxiety for both of us. Regular meetings with the men in his discipleship group have proved a joyful blessing, and we've had wonderful discussions about what he learned about Zechariah. He's been faithful in attending, even though they now meet on Zoom. Well, Doug's love languages are receiving physical touch and giving acts of service. Hugs have become even more frequent and I love it and I welcome them unless he comes up behind me for a hug and I'm chopping vegetables. That's not a good combination. He's eager to take care of me and waits on me faithfully. If I so much as mention that I need a phone charger or a glass of water, it immediately appears. He does an amazing job of doing our laundry he manages the dishwasher, the automobile maintenance, and the vacuuming. Purging and downsizing are not in his realm of interest or consideration, and that scares me because we seriously need to declutter, starting with the garage. Clutter can be really confusing for those with dementia. We do play brain games, such as how many fruits and vegetables can you name in one minute? What are words that have to do with golf? How many puzzle makes, how many automobile makes and models are there? There seems to always be a jigsaw puzzle under construction in the dining room, in the, on the dining room table. He loves doing word searches. He hates Sudoku, and I involve him as much as possible when I'm doing a crossword. And he often surprises me by coming up with some obscure word. He reads lots of books, and he enjoys um, playing a game of chess once in a while with his granddaughters. Ready? A helpful book I'm reading is The 36-Hour Day, which has so many helpful and practical suggestions. It's by Nancy Mace and Peter Rabins. And the reason it's called The 36-Hour Day is because 24 hours in a day is not sufficient for the caregiver um, with someone who has um, dementia. It's filled with wonderful suggestions, uh, good medical information, 
And if you know of anyone who is caring for someone with dementia, I would highly recommend this book. I've given away multiple copies, including one to each of our kids. I keep requests simple for Doug. No more than one or two steps, which is a suggestion that came from the 36-hour day. If I give him more than one or two steps or one or more tasks, he forgets some of them. I provide reminders. Don't forget to take out the trash, pick up the mail, water the plant. And if I ask him to do something, he usually responds very cheerfully with, I'll do it right now. And then he may get distracted and the same task may remain for hours or days. We look for opportunities to laugh. The heartier, the better. We share things that make us laugh, the comics, funny Facebook comments from my crazy cousin in Montana, laughing at ourselves. I do find myself taking more and more responsibility. Are the doors and vehicles locked? Are the tools put away? What's on your calendar for today? I do keep a sharp eye on credit card purchases. We talk about scams and how to identify them. He has become a little less caring about his physical appearance. And so I usually try to give him the once over before we leave the house. I frequently remind myself of Matthew 6:34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Some wise person once said that worry is a lack of trust in God. Ouch. So how can all of you support us? Don't change the way you interact with Doug. Don't be offended if he calls you by someone else's name. Draw him onto, into conversation. He loves puns, so if you hear a good groaner, please share it with him. Encourage your husbands who know Doug to continue to include him. Take him out for breakfast or coffee or lunch. Invite him to play golf when the weather is decent or to go for a walk. One of our ministry partners who currently serves in Asia, Laura Elliott, recently wrote an article on what she has learned from God's Word about where to find peace in times of turmoil. She reflected on Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Then Laura says, By faith I picture myself on God's lap, listening to his heartbeat as he holds me tenderly close, with his arms wrapped around me. However, when I worry about things beyond my control, I actually have a proud and haughty attitude. It's like I'm pulling away from the comfort he wants to offer me, so I always have a choice. I can quiet my heart and lean in like a weaned child, resting against its mother, being content and fulfilled by simply being in God's presence. Or I can cry and throw a tantrum, feeling alone and restless, looking to only my pride to comfort me. The psalmist says that I have a choice to make. I can let my heart be tossed and blown about by the tempests of life or I can choose to be still and quiet my soul. Calming my soul is a choice. When I find myself in a storm of life and out of control, I calm my heart and rest my head on God's big, reliable chest. I am silent and listen to his steady heartbeat, proclaiming his tender love for me. These days, it seems, I do it quite often. Laura Elliott is a wise woman. So let me close with these comforting words from another favorite psalm, Psalm 91, 4. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. So ladies... May our Lord richly bless you and your families during this wonderful season amid a very odd time. And may you make the choice to calm your soul. Amen.